Um, evening, folks. I've got John Dickinson here, and he's going to be giving you a detailed look at Erasure Codes in OpenStack Swift. Please give him a hand. Thanks. It's great to be here. This is the fourth time I've been at an LCA, and it's one of my favorite conferences to come to all year long. Uh, it's just really great stuff, and I love being here in Australia. So thank you, for, thank you for having me. And this year, I think, is one of the first times that I can remember that the talks are streamed live as they're actually being given, which is kind of cool, because I was just texting my, home, my family back at home, and I wanted to say, hi, Karen and Ian. And when I'm done, Ian, it's time to go to bed. So. Good night, I love you both, and I'll see you next week. Um, so today, I'm gonna talk about a detailed look in, um, of, uh, about erasure codes in OpenStack Swift. But first off, we have to set some ground rules. Where, where, where do we come from before we get into uh, the actual thing? Uh, as a little bit of background, um, I've been a developer for, I don't know, 10, 12 years, something like that and I uh, currently work on the OpenStack Swift project, and I've been doing that for about six years. Uh, so what is Swift? Swift is an object storage system. We're not talking about Taylor Swift, we're not talking about the programming language Swift, we're not talking about uh, European banking standard, this is OpenStack Swift, the, uh, the object storage system that is designed to let people store a large amount of data. And people are doing this all the time, every day, all over the world, which I think is really kind of cool. And the whole point about Swift is to offload the hard problems of storage so that the application developers don't have to think about it and that uh, the operators who are maintaining the clusters don't have to deal with some of these hard problems of storage. Some of those kind of hard problems of storage you can think about from the application perspective would be uh, stuff like, well, how do we deal with uh, a whole lot of connections going to our storage at once? How do we deal with maintaining uh, uh, concurrency of all of those connections and, and concurrent access to the same kind of data. How do we serve our data online? How do, we, um, how do we deal with handling failures? How do we deal with distribution of billions and billions of objects throughout petabytes of data? Um, an application developer doesn't want to care about that. They want to say, here's some bytes, and later I'm going to give them back. That's the point of Swift. Uh, and what's really cool about this is that we're seeing it used all over the world to do all kinds of things from uh, companies storing backups to games to web massive uh, trafficked websites, uh, making movies. It's just, it's been used by Wikipedia to store every single image that you look at on Wikipedia, and that's just really kind of cool. So uh, the point of Swift is to uh, store a whole lot of data, and that's about all the detail I'm gonna go into on that. You can look at other presentations and read more online about how it actually solves that. But in general, the design of Swift has two big parts. We've got a client who's gonna to talk to Swift, and, and Swift is made up of two pieces. You've got the proxy server and a storage node. The proxy server is what handles most of, most of the API implementation, and the storage node is what persists the data. So um, this is a really kind of cool design because what it means is that there's no single point of failure, there's no uh, uh, there's no place that's gonna have a bottleneck in performance. It means that you can, uh, if you need more someplace, you can add more. So if you need more storage capacity, add more storage nodes. If you need more uh, bandwidth, you can add more bandwidth. You can add more uh, proxy servers. And an important thing to note that we'll come back to a little later in this talk is that the protocol between each of these components is HTTP. In reality, there's a whole lot more than just one proxy server and one storage node in a Swift cluster. What you're really gonna look at is that a client's gonna talk to like a load balancer or something like that and speak to a pool of proxy servers. And then the pool of proxy servers is going to be connected to a probably even larger set of storage nodes. And each of the storage nodes are gonna have a whole lot of hard drives in them and things like that. So the thing about this is this gives you this stateless design. You can upgrade in place. You can uh, add and remove capacity uh, without any client downtime. And uh, since you've got this kind of modular system, you can, uh, you can swap things out and upgrade them in place. So it doesn't really matter what kind of hardware you're running on or if it's all even the same kind of hardware, the same kind of hard drives, the same kind of CPUs. Whatever you currently have available, you can add that to the, capacity, uh, to the cluster, and that's going to be added in to the overall capabilities of the cluster. So I don't have time to go into how uh, there's some really cool extensibility parts in this. Because you've got a nice modular system, you can start extending individual components and adding new functionality. Um, 
but that's not the scope of this talk. The scope of this talk is to talk specifically about one way to actually persist the data. Because ultimately, at its core, Swift is designed as a storage system to store your data. And so if we can't store the data, then we might as well go home. That's, there's nothing else that we really should be trying to do. Step one is to make sure we store the data. So when somebody hands us something, we're gonna durably write it down. And when somebody asks for it back, we're gonna give it back to them. So the key point there is the word durable. How do we durably store something? And the simple answer here is that you want to store it more than one time. You use replicas. So if you have a cat picture and you wanna store it, you store it three times, you store three cat pictures. And this is really kind of nice because it's very simple, it's very fast, it's very, uh, it's very easy. It's very easy code-wise, it's very easy to conceptualize. What it means is that uh, when somebody hands me a cat picture, I'm gonna copy it and write all three copies down at one time. And if I store each one of those copies, each one of those replicas in a unique failure domain, like a, do, a, new, uh, a different hard drive or a different server or even a different rack of servers, um, then the chance of me losing all of those at once goes down very, very far. It's, it's very unlikely that you're gonna lose anything. But the problem with replicas, I mean, I really love replicas. In, in, almost most, in almost all cases, you really should be using replicas. It's a really great way to do stuff. But the problem is you're storing three full copies of something. So if you're not storing cat pictures, but you're actually storing something like uh, multi-gigabyte backups or machine images or genomics data or something like that, then if you store one gigabyte, you now have to have three gigabytes of capacity provisioned. If you're storing five petabytes, you now have to deploy 15 petabytes to be able to support that five petabytes of usable storage. So the, the, the cost overhead of the storage gets to be very high when you're doing with full copies of your data. So what if we didn't have to do that? Erasure codes in general are fractional copies. So what does that mean? So instead of storing three full copies, we take one and then we store parts of it in different places. So this is not actually how erasure codes work, but the visualization does help me kind of understand. So in this, imagine that you have one cat picture and in this example, we've kind of broken it up into four fractional replicas, and you can see that I can lose any one of these. So the kind of the third one over there, you see has got some eyes, but if I, if I dropped that one out, I could still reconstruct from other pieces that I still have available, the pieces that I lost. So I didn't, so I still can withstand a failure in this mode, but I, I'm storing uh, less than, uh, say, full three replicas. So now let's talk about how that actually works. How do erasure codes actually works? And this is where we're gonna get into a little bit of math. So what are erasure codes? Erasure codes are a fairly old technology. They were, I believe, first invented around the 1960s, uh, somewhere around then. And they're commonly deployed in everything from raid cards to DVDs. And the basic concept comes from the simple idea that any two points make a line. So we know that you can, if you have the mathematical formula that says, here's a line, this rep represents a, li a line, the standard y equals mx plus b. If you have two points on that line, you can reconstruct what that formula was. But if you have three points on that line, you could lose any one of those points and still get it back. You can still figure out what the equation of that line was. Now let's expand that just a little bit. If we have three points, we make a parabola. And if you have four points, you have a third order uh, uh, polynomial, and so on and so forth, so that if you have, um, if you have m plus one points, you're able to make a polynomial of order m. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So, if we have, if we're given n points, such that n is bigger than m plus one, then at that point, we can recreate everything we need to know about that degree m polynomial. So the simple answer is, all you have to do is represent all your data as a polynomial. It's easy, right? <laughs> Makes total sense. So this took me quite a while to like, okay, yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't understand that. So it took me a while to actually kind of grasp that. So let's walk through an example. 
So right, we've got every, any two lines make a point, multiple uh, lines can give you a higher order polynomial. So let's look at an example. Ultimately we can, let's just start with the simple thing. Let's say uh, we start with a simple string. So let's encode the string, get A. So when you do erasure codes, you're going to erasure code a, uh, a chunk of data at a time. In this case, conveniently, we're gonna encode five bytes at one time, five characters. So the first thing we're going to do is we're gonna take, we're gonna encode these, these five characters, G, D, A, Y, and the apostrophe. And we'll use something simple. So A equals one, B equals two, so on and so forth. And then we get the apostrophe and we might as well say it equals 27. So we have a, sing a sequence of numbers that equals the word or the string, g'day. Now, we can use these coefficients as, these, these numbers as coefficients in a polynomial. And so you get something like this. f of x equals 7x to the fourth, 27x cubed, 4x squared, 1x plus 25. Now, that's what you mean by saying that you can represent your data as a polynomial. So for example, if we weren't using five for a fourth order polynomial, we could say, let's use something more realistic in storage and you might say, I want a 64K chunk of data. So you're gonna encode and you're gonna pad and you're going to end up with uh, uh, something that's a much higher degree. And in reality, this is a somewhat trivialized example uh, because in, uh, these are using normally uh, lots of things raised to prime powers and uh, finite fields and things that are frankly just well above my formal math education. Um, so this is a simplified example, but it, it does represent the concept. We take the string, we encode it in a normalized way, we represent those as coefficients of a polynomial, and then we say we need to store some points because we need to say that we can rec recreate those. So how many points do we store? Well, in this case, we know that we need to store at least five to get those, that fifth order polynomial. If we lose one of those, we wouldn't be able to get those back. But let's say we wanna survive, say, losing three individual pieces, then we can store a total of eight points. We calculate eight points of this function, eight values of this function. So let's simply use the numbers zero through seven. F of zero equals 25, all the way through F of, uh, F of seven equals 26,296. And at this point, we can, um, we store each of these numbers in a different place and we can lose any three of them and we can reconstruct that polynomial from the other numbers that we have left. And that's it. That is, that is all that is to erasure codes. And to me, when this kind of clicked and I was like, ah, that's it, that makes, that makes total sense. It's actually fairly simple in, the, in this particular example. Now, there's the question of, okay, so how do you get those back? And I'm not gonna go into the math on that, but if you wanted to look up more on that, it's uh, something called Lagrange interpol interpolation. It is necessary to cover all of that to give a full featured example and a simplified example of erasure codes, but uh, you know, kind of production erasure codes and, and more advanced libraries uh, don't exactly use this method. Um, but if you would like to look at some more, uh, some more detail on this, this, this example comes from one of my coworkers uh, named Zach Davis. Uh, this is a blog post uh, that he has up on our, our corporate website, uh, including uh, all of the code to implement both the encoding and decoding of data in erasure codes uh, using this exact scheme. And it's really cool, it's, it's fairly simple, it's very approachable, and it's something that you can say, yeah, okay, the math works, this, this makes sense. So at this point, I was feeling pretty good. It's like, great, I understand erasure codes. This, this kind of makes sense. We represent the data as coefficients of polynomials. We store however many we need to um, to survive our, our failures on uh, outputs of that polynomial. And then we can, um, and then and, and we're done, right? Well, it turns out the math is actually the simple part of implementing erasure codes in a distributed object storage system that is eventually consistent. So let's kind of dive into all of the rest of these parts. And you'll see, I'll come back to, um, I'll show you kind of a, a flow diagram of where we do erasure codes. And you'll see there's this one little piece where it's like, oh yeah, we do the math here. So inside of Swift, you remember this is, the, this is the design of basically how Swift works. So where do we do erasure codes in Swift? Normally, we're gonna do erasure codes in the proxy server. So as the data is streamed into the service, we're going to 
uh, take a chunk of data off the network, we're going to erasure code it, and then we're gonna send those back to the storage nodes and persist those. Now occasionally in the background, we do need to check that the data is still good. It's one thing it's important for, uh, uh, for any kind of storage system to make sure that you've got some, some sanity checking, some auditing checking, make sure the right data is in the right place. And so if we find something that's missing, we could potentially end up doing erasure codes on the storage, uh, on the storage nodes as well. So let's take each of those in turn. The first part, we'll talk about the right path. So remember I said that we use HTTP as the protocol between the client and the proxy and the proxy and the storage node. HTTP is a really, it's a really fun protocol. It's, it's fairly simple, you can type it in with curl, it's very powerful and like everybody has implemented it. Um, it is very complicated. Um, and has grown quite, uh, quite a bit com uh, more complicated over the years. Um, but we're just talking about standard HTTP 1 here. Um, and the basic idea is that you send a request, you have a verb that says like get, put, post, delete, something like that, and you get back a response code. And the response code might be 200 okay, it might be 503 we've got an error, it might be 404 missing, something like that. It's the kind of things that we normally see when you're dealing with browsers. There is there's another one that's uh, not nearly as commonly known. Um, who here knows about the 100 continue status code? A few of you, that's good. The 100 continue status code is really kind of cool because what it says is that in the request, you say that you expect to get back a 100 continue. So you send an expect header, expect 100 continue. You send that to the server. The server looks at it, the server gets the request and reads in only the headers, does not read the body of the HTTP request. Only the headers, and at this point, if the server can make a determination that the request would be either allowed or denied, then at that point, it can send the appropriate, it, it, can, it can short circuit a, uh, a, a, a final response if it needed to, uh, maybe an error or a, uh, something like that, for example, let's say you say uh, you wanted to, uh, you, you tried to create an object and you didn't have permissions to create that, then uh, you don't have to stream in a gigabyte worth of data just to get back, oh, you weren't allowed to do that. You can make that determination just based on that header information right then. So it's very nice because it can really save your, uh, save your network bandwidth. However, if the request would be allowed, then at that point the server can send back a 100 continue status code, which tells the clients, hey, everything is good so far, send me all the data. So that's really useful. It means that when I'm uploading data with a put request in, inside of Swift that has a one gigabyte body or a multi gigabyte body, I send it, the server is gonna send back a 100 continue, and then I know that I, I can safely go ahead and uh, start streaming the data over the wire without having to incur that cost if it was going to be denied. Now, there's a couple things in the HTTP protocol that are kind of fun. Did you know that you can send back multiple 100 continue responses in one request response cycle? It's kind of interesting. Did you know that the, you can send back arbitrary headers on the 100 continue response? That's kind of interesting. What that means is that we can, over HTTP, create this interesting bi-directional protocol between a client and a server. And, and yes, I know, we're not talking about HTTP2 here. Maybe that would go away with all of that, but I think this is actually really cool. Um, this is really, I think, using HTTP, not abusing HTTP. So why, why in the world would we actually do this? The reason we do this is because we need to be able to keep a checksum of the data that is sent into Swift. We want to be able to know that when you sent your backup in there, we're gonna calculate a checksum, we're gonna persist that checksum so that later we can go ahead and do this. That's really easy when you're talking about replicas because we can calculate it as it goes through, we can write it down, and everything's fine, because we can, we can even validate it at the end. If you send a checksum at the beginning, then um, we, can, we can pass that on and you can compare it at the end. 
you know what the checks, you know what that data is going to be on persisted on disk because it's just a one for one copy of the original data. With erasure codes, you can't do that because the data that's actually persisted is not the original data. Remember, it's that, it's that encoded version. It's the output of those polynomials that you, that you calculated. So how can we validate that the transport has succeeded correctly? HTTP does have this concept of footers, which are basically the opposite of headers. Headers come at the beginning of the data stream. Footers come at the end of the data stream. But the problem is the footers are only supported in the spec on the response, and we need them on the request. We need to be able to have the requester say, at the end, after we've passed through all of the, uh, the, the big data blob, we need to be able to say, oh, and there are other things. Uh, here, here's kind of like the, the extra metadata about all that stuff we just sent. So the kind of cool thing that we've done here, I think it's kind of cool, some people think it's a horrible hack, but the kind of cool thing that we've done here is we've taken this 100 continue request cycle combined with multi-part mine documents so that we can send a new, we say, hey, we're gonna put this data, great, go ahead and send it, here's a multi-part mime document. Great, here's the one, another 100 continue response, here's another multi-part mime document. And we get this bi-directional protocol that lets us talk back and forth over standard HTTP. So I think that's kind of cool. So here's how it actually works. And I know this is going to be a little small, so I, I, I will definitely read through it. We've got three columns here. Column on the left is for the client. The column in the middle is for the proxy server. And the column on the right is for the storage node, the actual uh, storage in the background. So the client will start by connecting to a proxy node, uh, server, just a standard socket connect, and then uh, set up the HTTP, HTTP connection, which sends in that verb, and then sends in the headers. At this point, we've got the ability to do some cool stuff. The proxy server can see what data are we trying to write to, figure out the places that it's supposed to be in the back, on, uh, what, storage, what storage nodes, what object servers is this actually supposed to be in inside of the cluster? So if we've got, say, a, uh, a five plus three erasure code scheme, so we've got a total of eight locations that we're going to do, like in the example earlier, then we're gonna choose eight out of all of the hard drives we have and use those as the right place to store things. So we can uh, determine the right chunk destinations. We can then connect to each of those, send those headers down, and this part, we've got that nice uh, 100 continue semantic. So the object server, if it's able to, if it actually has free space for it, it can respond back, great, 100 continue, and if not, it can return back a 507, uh, uh, no more disk space error. And so at this point, we've kind of set up the, uh, the connection, but we haven't actually started transferring data over the wire yet, or the, the actual real body of the data. So the client will start pulling from the, uh, the server, the proxy server will start pulling from the client, the client will start sending uh, chunks of data in that, in that put request. So this could be a gigabyte of data, or more. The proxy server, when it receives a chunk of data, say a megabyte off of the network, spools in a megabyte, and then it will call this method internally called chunk transform. That right there, that is the one place, that is, that's erasure codes right there. That is this, transform this megabyte into this erasure coded megabyte of stuff, which actually ends up being a little bit less than a megabyte, or a little bit more. At that point, we've got, say, all of the eight chunks that we need. We send those out to the individual object servers, and the object server receives that chunk and writes it down onto the disk. At the end of writing down all of those chunks after we've streamed the five gigabytes or whatever it is, the proxy server will create a new multi-part MIME document that has, here's some of the metadata associated with that. Say, here was the, uh, the, client, um, the client side content length so the, the stuff that's actually on disk will be much different uh, because it was erasure coded. Um, here is the client side checksum. Here is the internal checksum of what, what you should have, uh, the checksum of what you should have actually received from me as far as the, the erasure coded chunks. Uh, the object server will receive all that data, write down the metadata into extended attributes onto a file, and then it persists this, uh, this, this whole file onto disk and says, great, it's now gonna F-sync, and, and that data is now persisted to disk. The proxy server looks at all of the responses there and asks, did I get enough of good ones? So in, in the example that we had earlier of, I've got uh, 
I can survive three failures out of eight, so I've got five and three. Make sure that I got at least five back. Actually, make sure we got at least six back, just to make sure that uh, uh, we've got a little safety margin there. And if so, the proxy server will then send down another document and say, okay, commit it. In which case, we write down another kind of uh, a, a dot durable file, is what we call it in Swift. So we've got this multi-phase commit that's going on inside of Swift. Um, once that dot durable file has been uh, written down, the proxy server determines, did we get back enough dot durable responses? If so, choose the final uh, uh, response code for the client, client gets a respect, uh, response. And if everything went okay, you get this 201 created, everything's good. So we've now persisted your data with a lot of multi, uh, a lot of in interesting uh, HTTP chatter between the proxy and the object server. Does that make sense so far? Yes. Great, good. Okay, so the next part I wanna talk about is what's actually happening on disk, on the object server. And there's a few things that I think need to be, they're kind of important individually and they need to be tied together. I couldn't fit them all on one slide, so uh, we'll kind of take these as a whole and then we'll realize, okay, well now we see how it actually all ties together. So let's look at the on-desk seg segments. And here I've got an example with, I've got five fragments. Now actually, I've got five, what's the right word here? We take a segment of data from the client, and then we erasure code it, and we get fragments. Each fragment is gonna go onto a different section, a different hard drive in the system. So the the actual content of that fragment is the output of whatever that chunk, tra chunk transform method that we called earlier was. And that is largely dependent upon what erasure code library you're actually, you're actually using here. Um, as, this, as the chunks come into the object server, we get these, um, we get these new segments so this is one segment that is encoded into fragments, and as each, as we get new fragments, as we get new segments that come in and code those into new fragments, then we can append those onto the previous one. So we get our second fragments, we get our third, and so on and so forth until we get all the way to the end. Each of these concatenated segments of fragments are called fragment archives. This is a fragment archive, and it is stored as an object in the system on disk. So we've got each fragment archive is stored, in, in that example we had, say, um, five fragment archives, and that those would be stored on five separate disks. So then you can almost conceptualize this as, as like a two-dimensional structure where you've got the fragment by the, the, the segment that you're going to, and you can then start uh, getting some, uh, the right piece of data. The, the really cool, kind of cool stuff about this is we can still fully support range requests into the data when you're going to read it, because we can just do a little bit of modulo arithmetic based on that, on that segment size and the, and the fragment size, where are we supposed to be going, and then we know exactly what the offset needs to be, and we can just go read out that right, those, those uh, appropriate, um, those appropriate segments off of the fragment archives, unerasure code those, apply the right ranges to them, and then we get the right back, data back out. So this fragment archive is stored as a single object. On disk, ultimately, uh, inside of Swift, inside of every one of the hundreds or thousands of hard drives that are plugged into a single Swift cluster, you've got a local file system, and an object is represented ultimately as a directory. Um, and inside of that directory, you've got uh, four potential different kinds of specific files. You've got the .data file, which is really just containing the data itself, as you would expect. The .durable file was that really commit message that we were talking about. Um, most of the time, if uh, the metadata is stored in extended attributes on the .data file, but there's a possibility that you could update the metadata later, and that would be persisted as a .meta file, it's just then applied without having to overwrite the, the entirety of the data. And then we've got this uh, tombstone uh, that helps, helps us uh, persist deletes throughout the system and, and propagate those. So, 
kind of tie that together. And you can see that from the client to the proxy to the object server, and then that proxy to object server communication back and forth, as it is writing the streaming the data um, off of the network from the client, erasure codes those into the multiple chunks, creates these fragment archives that are then distributed out as ultimately what ends up being this data file. Um, once we have enough of that, we have the .durable file. The .durable file is important because the object server itself may come across an erasure-coded fragment archive, great, that's fine. You can't reconstruct the data from just one fragment archive. But it doesn't know if there are enough otherwise in the cluster to do that. So the .durable file is a marker to say that, yes, there was an authority, the proxy server, at one point in the system that said, yes, there is enough. This cluster knows that this is, this version of this file is something that needs to be persisted, and you actually do need to try to make sure that this is in the cluster persisted durably enough that we can reconstruct the object as necessary. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. Let's cover the read path first. The read path is relatively very simple. The head, path, the head request is actually trivial. I mean, just it is it's the most trivial thing ever, uh, ever because it's exactly like replicated storage. The metadata, uh, the head request only returns headers, does not return a body. The definition in the spec says that the, head re the response of a head request is exactly the same as the, the exact same get request, except it doesn't contain a body. So in this case, we just need to store all the metadata, and all, since the metadata is persisted non erasure code, but in, in, in totality on every single one of the, um, every single one of the fragment archives, we can choose any one of the fragment archives to go to, do a head request, get the data back, send it back, and it's good. We're done. Easy. The git is a little more complicated because we need to go to enough object servers, stream those back, so you can see exactly we need to go load those data files, those data files, uh, off of the object server, stream those back, we need to decode those. So given, uh, uh, say, our, our five plus three scheme, then we need, to, we need to make sure we have at least five of those, any five of those. The ratio code library will take at least five of those, or five, six, seven, or eight of those chunks that we gave it. Decode those actually give us the human formatted, the, the human consumable output. Uh, that's done in the proxy server on the response and sends that back to the client. So that can all be done streaming. So the nice thing about this is we don't have these, uh, we don't have to write it down and then later have asynchronously um, erasure code something or uh, we don't have to spool something as we are um, uh, returning something back. We don't have to spool in a gigabyte of data and then unerasure code it and uh, or decode it, erasure decode it, whatever. So that's all well and good. Now what? What do we do with failures? That's actually the, that's one of the, that's probably the hardest part of this whole thing. If we've got a failure, especially we've got to figure out when do we, when do we need to actually reconstruct just the, just the fragment archive that should have been on this one particular arc, uh, object server versus maybe that fragment archive is living someplace else in the cluster because the cluster is rebalanced and the data is shuffled around a little bit. So on write, it's pretty simple. We choose another one, and then we write that data out there. This is very, very similar to the uh, same, actually it is the same way that uh, the replicated storage works. Um, so it's kind of nice because it's using things that are uh, very well known and tested inside of, inside of Swift. And then on reads, we can't, if we, if we found the, uh, the object server was not there and we still needed more to get to, so in this case, uh, Ostensibly, we could survive one loss, and we wouldn't have to even go to handoffs. Uh, we could still reconstruct the data on the, on the response. Uh, but even if we had so many object servers uh, failed, uh, we could not get enough, a quorum to start with, then we would start looking at handoff nodes until we had enough connections that we could potentially get a quorum, read those, and, and make sure that we could, we could reconstruct it. Of course, maybe the data's not there, maybe we couldn't find it, uh, in which case we'd have to error to the client. But, um, We've got a background process inside of Swift called the object reconstructor. This is the process that is responsible for making sure that the thing that is actually living on the disk, the on-disk files inside of Swift on the object servers are the right thing and in the right place. 
So it has two modes of operation. To start with, it's gonna look and say what's on the disk. Very similar to our replication process. Our replication process for context is, um, is very simple in that it looks and says what data do I have locally? Where should it be in the cluster? Hopefully it's supposed to be on me and then I'm gonna check my other peers, two other peers, say if you've got three replicas. If it's not there, push it out. If it is there, great, you're good. Make sure it's the same thing, but then you know, make sure, uh, push it out and everything's good. With erasure codes, number one, you don't, you're not dealing with three replicas. You're dealing with things like 14 different erasure code locations, like for a 10 plus four scheme, or you may even have like a 17, 18 plus five for 23 different locations. You've got a lot more, and you do not want to start having every single one of these talk to every single other one of its peers just to make, something's going on, make sure something's going on there. You get this exponential complexity that really gets out of hand very, very quickly. Uh, you don't want uh, every, every subset, every possible combination of 23 servers out of your 2,000 drives that are on, uh, in your cluster to suddenly try to communicate with every other possible subset of 23 uh, drives, and that's, that would be untenable. So, what the, object, uh, what the object reconstructor does is looks at the uh, data that's on disk and will uh, find the things that are supposed to be there. And in that case, if it finds something that's supposed to be there, then it will check its peers. Not all of them, just its peers. Just looking in this case, it would be the left and the right neighbors. Now, in reality, it does loop around at the ends, and I did not show that with the arrows here, just for cleanliness. But the idea is that, uh, say, the second one will look at the first one and the third one, and so on and so forth, all the way down the chain. In this case, uh, it means that if one of them goes missing, you've got at least two, you've got two, up to two of them, that are going to be checking for it to see if it's there. That's the first mode of operation. If it finds that its peer is missing, if it finds data, um, if, if it finds that it has data locally and its peer is missing, then at that point, the object server will read in the necessary data that it can, reconstruct just that other fragment archive, push it out to the other, to its peer. Now the other operation could be that the object reconstructor found that it had data locally that no longer was supposed to be local, it's supposed to be someplace else in the cluster. And in this case, we don't need to do all of the erasure code math to do something, so we can simply push it, push this data to the right place where it's supposed to be. Now, obviously, erasure codes are expensive computationally, so these are operations that do require a good amount of CPU and RAM and uh, some degree of overhead for this. Of course, what you're trading off here is a whole lot less uh, required physical capacity for your cluster. So that's, that's the that's cost benefit in that, and I'll uh, cover that in just a moment. So that's the basic idea, in a nutshell, of failure handling. Now, what does this actually look like in production? So we've done uh, quite a few tests. Um, highlight a few things here. First off, uh, we did some tests on write. What's really interesting about this is you'll see there's a couple of these lines, the, the green one and the red one, that uh, are up higher to start with and then flatten out sooner than the others. Those are replicated policies. The green one, the taller one, is a 2x replica, and the red one, the lower one, is a 3x replica. And you'll see that they work pretty well on, uh, the x-axis here is different sizes of objects, so all the way from 1K objects to 128 megabyte objects. What's really interesting about this is that, well, it makes ex exactly the sense that you would, you would imagine. Uh, there's less computation on the right, so they're able to go faster sooner. That's great. However, they peak out faster because, say, 3x replicated storage, if the data is coming in at one time, uh, it has to go out three times. And it turns out this peaks out at about 300, 333 megabytes per second. Guess what speed our network was? <laughs> so basically, we were network bound right here, um, and, the, t and the, uh, the 2x replica peaked out at 500 megabytes a second. So uh, it's exactly what you'd expect as far as replicated storage here. The erasure coded storage uh, does not have as high of network requirements because less, disk, less data is actually getting persisted to disk. 
Uh, so it can uh, spike up a little more before it itself saturates the network. Um, on, the, on the read performance, um, replicas are faster across the board. There's less math that you have to do. There's less network connections that you have to do. Um, but overall, uh, depending on whatever uh, erasure code parameters you're using, um, the basic shape is all the same. Um, and we're able to get fairly reasonable performance out of everything. Um, importantly, erasure codes are good for um, larger objects. You don't want to start erasure coding your 1K objects, your 100 byte objects, things like that. You want to start erasure coding your 100 megabyte objects, your multi megabyte objects, and things like that. Um, looking at the deployment, you can, uh, you can configure quite a few things on here. The important piece I wanted to call in was uh, the way we actually do erasure codes is with a pluggable library. We have a um, a Python, Swift is written in Python, so we have a PyEC lib wrapper written in Python that wraps up lib erasure code. Lib erasure code is a C library that has a couple of, uh, has a couple of software implemented non-accelerated um, erasure code libraries in it just kind of uh, that you can use uh, short term, but in reality you probably want to uh, put in some other larger, well, more well-known uh, libraries, things like J erasure. Um, Intel has a library called ISA-L um, that is free as in beer but not as in speech, and they have got a special proprietary license on it, uh, but they have a free version of it that, actually no, I think, no, 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 you have to do sign something on that. But um, you can download it freely, uh, and it's, uh, it has all of the erasure code libraries on it, works great on Intel's chips. The one concern here is with small files, as I mentioned, is there is not yet in Swift a small file optimization. This is something that is a known area that we need to address. Uh, and so if somebody, if you can't control what sizes of objects people are going to be writing into Swift, then it's going to be something that's a little, uh, it's a little hard uh, to deal with. So just to wrap up just a little bit here, I'm, I'm getting, the, getting the eye from the monitors here. Good use cases for EC. Great for backups, great for video storage, great for genomics and DNA research and scientific data sets, these kind of large data sets uh, that uh, you've got a lot of data, you've got to keep it around, you don't know when you're going to need it, you're going to need it, um, but uh, it's not something that's going to be like, I've got a million views on this picture right now. Um, good cases for replication are kind of all of the things that Swift has been good for already, you know, looking at documents, looking at online uh, photos, games, videos. Um, things like that, the kind of uh, storage for the internet. So with that being said, maybe a couple of questions. This, uh, this entirety of this presentation is available right now online uh, at that URL, um, so you can find it there. There's a question in the back from Bruno. I'll repeat the question. There you go. Okay. Better. Um, erasure coding in um, geo-replication. Uh, erasure codes more, and geo-replication. Why is it not a good idea? It, it goes together about as well as chocolate cake and mustard. Exactly. Um, it's generally not a good idea because you generally don't have infinite network between your two, replicate, your two uh, sites. Um, there's no technical limitation on it, but I would strongly advise you not to try that. Basically, imagine this. If you've got a 10 plus 4 scheme, uh, so a total of 14 locations, where any 10 of them can reconstruct your data, and you put it into two data centers, seven in each, one data center goes down, or your WAN link goes down, you now have seven that you cannot read your data on. You have a data availability issue. Um, and to reconstruct that, you've got to move a lot of data across the network. So that's the very short answer of why it's generally a bad idea. Uh, to do that. One question? Yes, over here? Or here? Uh, what's the recovery plan when there's corruption on one of the objects? Oh, that's, a, that's a great thing. I didn't, I didn't cover that. Um, the reason I didn't cover that was because it was nothing new inside of Swift. We're actually using the exact same thing we were using for the replicated storage. Every single on-disk file, those fragment archives, end up storing their own checksum as well. And so we've got a background auditor process that uh, 
any time one of those um, one of these files is written in its entirety off of the disk, whether by the background auditor or even on a client read, uh, we will compute the checksum, and if it is bad, we will quarantine the data uh, and move it out of the way and let either reconstruction or replication repair it. So computation is obviously a major bottleneck in Razor Codes. So what's the status of hardware acceleration of that computation, sort of FPGAs, GPUs, that sort of thing? I would ask my friends at Intel for that. Um, the, I don't have an answer for that, I don't think. I mean, or maybe I don't completely understand. Uh, if, if you've got an erasure code library that would interface with lib erasure code, and that does provide hardware acceleration, um, direct hardware acceleration, like IS, uh, I think ISAL does provide something like that, but um, J erasure has also been optimized quite heavily over the years. Um, then those will take advantage of that. Um, but yeah, it, 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 you are absolutely right. It is computationally expensive relative to replicated storage. It, did that, I don't, I don't feel like I answered your question, but. Um, well, so thinking about, you know, why is this not used, for example, in traditional RAID setups to get to do erasure codes? And I'm guessing it might be because it's difficult to put down to say FPGAs or, you know, um, to do in, you know, hardware accelerated architecture. Um, is that, it is, is it fundamentally difficult to do in that architecture or is it just? There is nothing that is in the architecture that we have in Swift for erasure codes that would make that particularly more difficult to do at all. The, the actual math and how that's computed is just really just a very small part of the overall system. So yes, that would be absolutely possible. Normally, uh, in my experience, um, since people who are deploying Swift are really looking for the commodity hardware, they're not looking to say, let's add 500 to a couple thousand dollars extra per server when I've got hundreds of servers out there to accelerate this piece. Maybe, maybe that would work for a particular use case, but uh, I wouldn't see that there's anything that particularly limits that, or, but it's really, I think, would be up to the implementation of the Ratio Code Library. We're out of time for any more questions today. If you do have some, don't be afraid to hunt down John uh, if you see him in the halls. On behalf of the Linux community, I would like thank to you. say thank you very much for your time and your talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you.